I was driving safe, I just couldn't read a single road sign. I don't know. It wasn't even this that was bothering you? It was, but I think I just got used to squinting. <laughs> no. What? Does anyone know where the rest of the people are? Live stream. All right. No, they're not on the game. Let's get going. If you want. All right. Well, today I have uh, our guest speaker is Michael Darter, and he's a kind of long career in pavements and in academia and also in industry. So I'm going to let him give his his background. He's also originally from here in Spanish Fork. So. Thank you. Talk about yourself and your travels around the world. <laughs> yeah, I grew up just down the road. <laughs> no interstate here that in that time. <laughs> Two lane highway. Well, I'm really happy to be here. I live in Salt Lake City now. I grew up here and uh, went to the University of Utah and then went to other places that I'll tell you about and uh, spent most of my life in Illinois, at the University of Illinois, actually, and then working in consulting all over the world. So uh, I knew Amanda as a student, and she was there in uh, university. And so I'll just get started here, but uh, I hope that this will be helpful to you all. And I just want to say, first of all, congratulations for getting this far. I remember how happy I was, how happy my parents were. They were even happier than me, because <laughs> I don't think they thought I'd ever get here. Um, but anyway, I did, and uh, as I look back, you know, I try to pick a photograph that kind of think, I think about my career, and it's almost like, you know, working at capacity for many, many years. And that highway, that's up near Madison, I think, or uh, uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, Suzette and I just, oh, my wife is Suzette, and she's right back there, so. She's a business manager and an artist, uh, so if you get lost down that art, artistic hall down there, we'll understand. <laughs> but anyway, you know, that kind of reminds me of my career, and uh, which was kind of crazy. I grew up right down the road here in Salem, and uh, attended Spanish Fork High, where, you know, drinking beer, was by far the most preferred thing, and especially for me. Um, but I got a couple funny things out of high school, and I know you're going to laugh. Music, you know, rock and roll started in the 50s, and boy, we, you know, I, I, my mother was a musician, and my family and everything, so I got into that big time. We had a band, and we played all over. So that was a, a real, uh, I'm very thankful for that because I could have gotten a lot of trouble. Uh, but we spent a lot of our free time practicing, so I stayed out of a lot of trouble, I guess you might say. Anyway, uh, and the last one is really funny. My mother is a writer, a journalist, and from the Netherlands, she could speak several languages and just an amazing woman. She insisted that I take type. Now, in those days, boys did not type. Doesn't that sound weird? It's bizarre. And um, I was the only one in the class. There were lots of girls, but I was the only boy. <laughs> oh, uh, but I, I refused, but she insisted. So what do you do, you know? I did it, and it turned out to be one of my greatest assets. And go ahead and laugh again. <laughs> because when I got to Illinois, many of the faculty, you know how they were kind of typing like this. And I was going like this. I could, you know, it helps you become a better writer. I found that out immediately once I learned how, because you can correct and all kinds of stuff. But anyway, I got a couple things out of it. Uh, this was in the 60s from uh, in high school and then all through university. I was actually uh, had fun, but I, you know, made enough money to survive and live on. And that was <laughs> the biggest reason pushed me into uh, music because I could make some money playing, you know, for all kinds of things, weddings and 
sometimes clubs, we were underage, but we still, seems like the undercover agents never really check our ID, the band's ID. They check <laughs> anybody sitting at a table. Uh, so little did they realize we were all, you know, way underage. But anyway, that's fun. How did I get in civil engineering? Because I really loved music, and that was my thing, you know. My dad, that's the answer. My dad was, you know, about 60 when I was born. It's kind of, we miss a whole generation. It's kind of an interesting life uh, to do that. But he, he grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, and his uncle was the Tarrant County civil engineer and surveyor. And so my dad learned surveying through him. And then as soon as he turned, I think, 20 or 21, he joined the U.S. Navy. He was sent out into the South Pacific, and they did a lot of mapping in American Samoa. So he got to climb mountains and do baselines and angles and calculate mountain heights and make maps. And then uh, he got back into San Francisco the day after the, that horrible earthquake hit in 1906. He told me the stories that he saw of, of people that died and smoke and burning and just, he talked a lot about infrastructure that I never forgot. He went uh, after that to the University of Texas. That's the survey crew. That's really kind of bizarre, isn't it, to look at those guys, except one guy, obviously a rancher. Uh, the other guy had <laughs> white shirts and ties on. Uh, interesting. After he finished there, uh, he went to uh, uh, Los Angeles, Southern, Southern California, and, and went to work immediately for Southern Pacific. Married, started having, had a couple of kids, had a brother and a sister. And I had a wonderful career, 30-year career with Southern Pacific, and that just shows just a couple of pictures. And one of the things he used to keep telling me when I had, uh, you know, I got into engineering school, and well, this was even in high school, was to check your work. He had seen so many examples of contractors accepting things without checking, or engineers not checking their work, and. You know, that can end up in a huge legal crisis for you as an engineer or as a contractor or as a designer or whatever. You should make a mistake. Um, you know, you can, really, you can really cause yourself grief, and he saw that happen. It, and he checked his work uh, every time, had people, he told me that, so I became that way. So I'm telling you, that's a good idea. <laughs> um, well, I became convinced after first semester in college that civil engineering was a better choice for me than music um, for many, I guess, for many reasons. Uh, so that's, uh, I had to start over, of course, in math, physics, chemistry, all at once. But in my first year, I was able to catch up. I took extra classes. I was amazed that I could catch up and do well. And a big break uh, was to get a job at UDOT that summer up in Salt Lake in the design, the geometric design. I was able to sit at his big desk, he had a big computer, well, calculator. <laughs> this was 1963. But you could do square roots on it, you could do everything, and do, you know, check plans and, and, and where uh, bridges and curvature and all the coordinate system. And that required a lot of trigonometry a lot of geometry, math, you know, algebra, of course. And I got paid a dollar eighty an hour for sitting, at, uh, I was a farm boy. I mean, my experience up to then was this right here. <laughs> and that's, uh, that makes you realize, uh, you know, you want something better when you clean chicken coops and farmyards and paint barns and build fences, I don't know. I, Made me realize that, but that was the real break uh, that I got. So I started my junior year at the University of Utah. I loved my classes and professors. They were most of them were older, but they were very experienced guys. They were very, uh, very helpful and practical. Well, I won't kid you not. My undergrad was uh, difficult. I worked had to work Utah half time. I played in clubs every Friday, Saturday. I, ha I married right out of high school. Had a child. And then she dumped me right after I started at the University of Utah. <laughs> now that was tough. That was tough, about as tough as it gets. And I, my grades, you know, like that. So I was called into 
the probation committee. There was some really old looking folks, men and women, professors, you know, there's a committee like that. You can you can protest anything at, the, at a university if you want, by the way. There's a formal way to do anything if you think you've been cheated or, you know. And they were thinking of kicking me out, you know, and I pleaded my case. And I'm sure out of the five or six people there, several of them had been divorced and had gone through that terrible emotional stress and trauma of losing a child and all that. So I pleaded my case. They said, okay, we'll give you another semester. Okay, I made it. I, I passed every class. Went on. Uh, one of the classes I had, again, technical report writing by, a, by an editor of a big construction magazine. And then this guy, boy, he really taught us how to write papers and presentations. What is an introduction? What is an abstract? You know, I don't know if you've ever taken classes like that. And how do you reference things? How do you find references, you know? All kinds of things. Um, and we had to practice and do it in class. And that, that class turned out to be one of the best classes that, that helped me in my career over many years. And I tried to pass on a lot of that to students. Okay, well, I got hired then uh, in 1966, graduated in the structural division of UDOT. And I was there for several months when a professor at the university called me and said, we have a really great Phil's Petroleum Fellowship, and I think it was like $3,000 cash. That was a lot of money. In those days, that was a lot of money. If you'll do your master's degree, and um, UDOT jumped in and said, we'll pay your salary. If you do a project that's beneficial to us. Well, I was, in, I was going to be a structural engineer. I had all those classes. Oh, okay, I'll go to the materials lab and, you know, and uh, I wondered about it. But, you know, ultimately I used all of my structural background and training in pavement design, as you'll see in a minute. Well, why would you go after an MS or an MBA? I was really thinking of MBA. You know, it boils down to one simple thing. It's an investment in yourself. And I talk to people about that. It, of guys working, uh, men and women, you know, engineers. Why do that? Well, Mike, you're, in, you're investing in yourself. You're going to have faster promotions, assuming all things are, are, are equal, you know, faster promotions, more money. You'll have better opportunities to work wherever you want in the world. And more and more people are having advanced degrees, and there's so much more knowledge. Et cetera, et cetera. And I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. <clears throat> so that's the way to look at it. You're investing in yourself when you go into anything like this. You're investing in yourself, and it could pay off big time. So you not took me out to a roadways, the chief engineer, and look at these cracks. These are big transverse cracks in asphalt. That was my first photograph. Uh, this is another road, but you can see these big cracks, they're widening out over time. He said, do your thesis on that, and we'll, we'll join in with your uh, supporting it. I said, yes, sir. So I designed an experiment, because uh, I figured, boy, you know, that looks an awful lot like thermal expansion and contraction. It's something to do with this. And then I read literature, of course. That was very helpful. And there's other causes of this. But I just started testing beams of hot mix asphalt. It was all compacted, of course, and then built a whole system to cool it, heat it, and discovered every time you heat it up and, and cool it down and heat it up and cool it down, it shrinks a little bit. You know, we all know concrete shrinks. So that's obvious. Water goes off. But nobody thinks about hot mix asphalt. There was never a paper written until this. And, but it does. And so that sets up tensile stresses and creates these cracks. And once they're created, then they keep getting wider and they create potholes. They create roughness. So it's, it shortens the life by 50% sometimes, especially Utah, because we have very cold, very hot, you know, it, it goes that whole rain. Okay, let me speed on here. <laughs> Discovered that asphalt uh, absorbs into high, you know, highly absorptive aggregate and into the air void. So if you put a cap on the aggregate absorption, you can uh, reduce that down 
and, and reduce them. You won't stop it completely. Now, there's a lot of other research done on you know, changing the characteristics of the asphalt. But that's what we did here, and two other guys carried on their master's degrees as well. Okay. So after that, they assigned me and my partner there, Mike Tuckett, two more years uh, at UDOT in construction. Uh, it, was it was mostly on a big project down in Green River. UDOT wanted to test a synthetic rubber mixed with, uh, with asphalt. So they asked, uh, Mike and I were in charge of the technical parts of the contract. They let the contract to this contractor, Cecil Cox. He was quite a character, and they warned us. They said, Cecil can be very rough on inspectors and engineers. He slugged one the other last project. And we said, oh. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, we're way down in southern Utah, you know, away from everybody. You know. um, okay, well, we sat down with, with Cecil and showed him utmost respect. We're here to help you. We want you to get 100% of your bid and we want to even save you money. We want to help, you know, there's a lot of equipment that has to be bought. And you probably don't have the, the people on your crew to do that. And so we'll help that. He ended up giving us a checkbook, blank, signed. Federal check sign, go to Salt Lake, buy the equipment. We needed a weir, we needed this and that, all kinds of stuff. In a big continuous mixed plant. Uh, this is about the last day of the project. He came up to Mike and I, put his arms around and said, thank you guys, thank you, thank you, thank you. I mean, what happened? <laughs> After being warned and, oh my God. I think this is the word, Mike and I, I just, Mike and I con kept in contact and respect is the key. You show respect to your clients, people you work with, who you work for, you'll go a long ways further. So it was extreme, you know, I, I want to emphasize that practical experience, four years and three years before that part-time, but was really, really valuable to me and my students because so many folks go on after uh, academic and, and go right into teaching or so, but I felt, you know, that was a, a, a benefit to me and, and some of my students too. But after four years, I had that feeling. Maybe some of you know what that is. You wanted more, you know? I wanted more technical knowledge, I wanted to travel, I wanted to teach, and I wanted <laughs> more money. Again, investing in my future. So I applied to 10 universities, got accepted to several, and after a lot of discussions and visiting, I went to, decided on the University of Texas at Austin. That's where my dad and my uncle went. So our family home was in Fort Worth. And my uncle was still living there, my dad's brother, and so I got to know him. It was a wonderful experience. Um, but I remember driving down I-15 with a small trailer and thinking with my family, because I had remarried and had a couple more children, thinking, what the hell are you doing, Mike? <laughs> You're, you quit a really good job, and I, I could see you know, that I could move up in UDOT and have a good career. And I'm giving that up to go take a big risk. Can I pass the classes? I mean, there's more competition when you've got lots of international students coming in, and they're always very, very they're top of their class. And so there's work, more competition, and, and it, it, you know, it really, and, and if I do obtain a PhD, what will I do, where will I go? All those kinds of things. But I kept driving. And when I got there, of course, I knew they had an excellent, a good program, and it was even really better than I thought. Um, and just about that time, the Texas DOT had developed a new pavement design methodology. And the one thing they didn't put into that was any safety factors. They didn't put, uh, you know, most design procedures, even in 1970, were based on reliability and risk. Today, I think everything is. <laughs> all the ACI, all the stuff is ASC steel. Um, and I had, uh, I didn't mention that, I, I really fell in love with, uh, on that, uh, that, that Green River project. I, they, the UDOT hired an expert engineer and statistician to help us. 
this guy really knew statistics, and, and I just fell in love with statistics and probability and reliability. As soon as I saw that, you know, think of that. You're, in, in, in the state of Texas, you're designing some districts in Houston, huge amounts of truck traffic. Others out in the west farm to market roads, almost no truck traffic. You're going to design them at the same level of reliability? That's crazy. That's wasteful spending. Or, I mean, you know, so there was a big argument among all these districts. It wasn't thick enough, or it was, you know, maybe, you know, most of them were, it wasn't thick enough. They, they thought it wasn't a reliable design method. So I jumped right into that and, and proposed, after thinking it through and, and getting help from TechStock guys, a design reliability procedure, adding that to the structural design. And that's what I did. They, they accepted that and, and eventually in, adopted it. And it's still there today. They changed the procedure, but, but that reliability is still there. So finally, graduated. Uh, it, was a, it was a good decision. But now what? Well, um, I had started meeting people. I went to TRB in Washington, Transportation Research Board, and had met people from around the country. And, the uh, University of Illinois met me and, and uh, said, come on over, have an interview. So I did. And that was the number one CE department for many, many years. Still is up in the top two or three, I think, Amanda. It's uh, U.S. News World Report. They rate all the detail of the undergraduate, the graduate, and all that kind of stuff. But it's still right up there. And had a tough interview. <laughs> But I must have passed, they offered me the job, and I ended up there spending the next 25 to 30 years at the university, uh, teaching and doing many big research projects, supported a lot of grad students. Uh, if, you know, if you go in, into a, a school, you, you can go on in a master's with, a, with an assistantship. Uh, Amanda did that and paid half time, which is a reason you could survive on it, <laughs> probably. Uh, and uh, all your fees and everything, but you know, you work half time and <clears throat> on a project that becomes your thesis. So it's a pretty good deal. Uh, and if you ever go to grad school, uh, be sure to look into that aspect of, of it. Okay. Um, now I knew state DOTs. I knew the Federal Highway Administration because I had dealt with many people there. So I knew what they were looking for many times. So. I was able to write good proposals, and um, and, there, and there was a good group of, of people to work with in my my area, my department. Was, there were 75 faculty members. There. I mean, it was a big department, big department. So the other thing, though, uh, they allowed you to work 20 percent, as most universities do, on personal consulting. So that gave me a lot of practical experience. And I was involved in projects all over the country, pavement failures, material issues, traffic, you know, all kinds of heavy loading where they're gonna move a nuclear power plant pieces and you gotta get all kinds of approvals. What does that do to the pavements? There's lots of interesting things. Uh, construction problems and errors, you know, and they all cause, you know, create havoc out there in the performance. And even some expert testimony uh, for, for trials and things like that. Uh, one of the best things that ever happened was just after I got there, not long, maybe a year, Corps, there was a big Corps of Engineers lab just north of, of the university campus. And they did all the research, a lot of research for the Corps of Engineers. And the Air Force asked that they would fund a big project to develop for Air, Air Force payments of the airport side, uh, a, a rating procedure called Pavement Condition Index. And they wanted it so a guy, an experienced person, could go out, look at the pavement, measure the cracking, measure the rutting, measure the um, all kinds of stuff, and put that into some equations and come out with a scale that met uh, expert engineers who said, if you take a, a group of expert engineers, look at this pavement, I call it poor, poor, poor. You know, it was a so you could just measure that, calculate a number, and that's if you had a whole team of experienced engineers, you'd get the same number. So that's what I thought that approach, and that really worked. 
But I got to travel to a lot of big bases, and I was I was just shocked. 100 the Air Force, the, just the Air Force, 150 big bases. They're, they're cities, and there's miles of pavements in there, both uh, you know autos and and of course airport and the air side. Many big planes. And so the military is a big, big client for any civil engineering uh, person, um, let alone the FAA to all the commercial airports. Anyway, we developed that, and to my utter amazement, the Air Force, the Army, and the Navy, all the, all the uh, Coast Guard adopted that. ASTM jumped in a few years later, adopted it. FAA then adopted it worldwide for commercial airports. So that was a still going on today. It's uh, in all the manuals and books and everything. So uh, anyway, that was fun. Uh, about 1980, uh, the Federal Highway released a big uh, RFP, Request for Proposal, to so run a training course in, in rehab. We're having a lot of problems on our interstate highways by 1980. See, a lot of them were built in the 60s, 70s, and by 80s, they were falling apart. <laughs> So let's develop a big training course. Okay. Look, I got every faculty member in our group, six, five or six of it, to join me on a, in a company. They were actually didn't own the company. Three of them were part, partners of it. And we put a, a proposal in and bid on that and won the project. Because with that group, you can cover all the asphalt, all the concrete, all the traffic, all kinds of things like that, pavement evaluation, materials, all of that, uh, challenging stuff. Put together a, a training course and taught it for almost 20 years, all around the country. I learned more than anybody did. <laughs> and it was, it was kind of daunting, you know, you're going to go in front of a class of experienced engineers and try to teach something, you better know what you're doing. And I, but I learned, if I couldn't answer, which many times I could not, what did I do? Did anybody have an answer for that question? That somebody would raise their hand. That's what I would do. And that would sound pretty reasonable. Uh, so you learn how to, how to deal. <laughs> okay, well, that company uh, was a big gamble. You know, 90% of small businesses go kerpoot. Well, we had to put our own money into this thing, but you know, it started slowly, and there was a few times we thought we were done, but it grew, and then it grew. And Ten years later, these partners uh, decided we've had enough, we got to get out. Uh, so if you ever go into business with a partner, check that partner out very carefully, and you better have worked with them before, <laughs> because you know, that will mean success or failure of your business. You know, if you have big fights and arguments. We, had, we didn't really have that many. They just got tired of the pressure. So, okay. Um, all right. We just kept going. Because we had some really good employees. We kept going, and it grew. It became an employee-owned company. That's a big deal. You can work for a company. Uh, because then you can get stock in that if you see it growing. So by 1999, we had a staff of 60 people, 6 million in revenue. This was to all levels of government, uh, the military, and uh, contractors, and material suppliers, um, all kinds of, of, of you know, private, uh, that, that deal with pavements. And, uh, you know, it, it became intense. We had three offices. And I, I just couldn't do it anymore. So, and, and the other guys thought we could move up. If we could find a bigger company that would purchase us that had the same philosophy, high tech, do the project right is the most important. That was our philosophy. Uh, we solicited offers and got two good ones. And we, after a lot of discussion, accepted Applied Research Associates. ARA is a much larger hub real big high-tech company. They don't do regular consulting work, and uh, we brought a little of that in, but they, they have big military, environmental, security, high-tech. If any of you need a job, that would be a, a, a place I would recommend, because they have hired a number of people from Utah 
I think from BYU, from the University of Utah, maybe others. And, um, um, the, the, the philosophy was that, you know, doing a, go a really good job was the most important thing. And I'll admit, there was a couple projects that I overran the budget on. And things happen, and you may underestimate things, but ARA stood behind me, and stood behind other people, not just me, and bailed us out, and got the project on, back on track, uh, and, and made the client happy. Well, that's, that's good in so many ways, isn't it? That helps your career, your reputation. Instead of doing this, it, you know, it kind of goes up a little bit. But, so, they have the same philosophy, and they're employee-owned. The stock of ARA went from $10 an hour, or a share, almost 200 now. Can you imagine? Yeah, it's over 2,000 employees, and uh, they're really doing well. I retired fully uh, about five years before this and uh, just started working part-time for ARA and for the last 20 years that's the kind of stuff that I've been doing for them. Let me just show you a couple projects and then we'll have some questions and answers. Um, this is one that's right out here. Utah started in about, I don't know, 2008, something like that, we called Design Bill. This is quite an amazing thing. They, uh, they, they, here's, they, they define a project. This was from Lehigh to Spanish Fork to, to Provo, really, originally. And this is what we want. You know, so many traffic lanes, so on, so on, so on, so on. A team's form of contractors, the big designers, materials people, you know, all the utilities and safety and traffic and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we got on the team because I had met a number of people from Wadsworth Construction. Anybody know Wadsworth here? Anyway, they, uh, there's two of them and they combined. They were brothers, but they, for this one, it's a massive project, almost $2 billion. And we put a whole program design, you know, did show them how we would have designed the pavement. We could extend this to Spanish Fork and we could turn it into a 40-year design instead of 30 or so what they had. And we won and went through numerous interviews and boy, they were not easy. The project went on in 2010, 11, and 12. There was an army of people. Anybody remember that out here? Or you guys remember, probably weren't right here, but there was an army from Lehigh to Spanish Fort. And they didn't train all the people out working very well because there were so many screw-ups on the construction side. And I had to fly out here every two weeks and start, look, what happened here? What happened here? Okay, remove and replace. No, 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 no. A big argument, okay, we'll remove and replace. All right. Uh, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, it was, it was a... So in 2013, ASHTO, now that's American Association of State Highway Officials, they represent all the state DOTs. They give awards every year for the best project or two projects. They gave this to UDOT, the award to UDOT for the massiveness of this project. This was the biggest project in the country, I think. We saved a lot of money for what they had estimated it, did it two years earlier, 40-year pavement design, and extended it to Spanish Fork, which thrilled a lot of people down in that area. So it was, uh, it was both con mostly concrete, but a lot of asphalt. And when you think of this, you have to design the, uh, the main line, then and the HOV lanes, and you've got ramps going on and off, you've got uh, frontage roads going on and off, you've got cross streets going. So there's 20, 30 designs. Pavement design, that's just pavements, not all, let alone bridges. Look at the bridges on this thing. Same thing there. You know, across streets, you know, all kinds of bridges in, in many, many ways. And, um, and then you have to have contractors that can do all this work, specialize in bridges, but you know. And so it, it was a, an absolute nightmare, but it, it really paid off, it really did. And then they uh, did another project just north of there, 
I, what what really happened is that the I I fifteen I had no I knew it, was, it had about that much asphalt down there over many years they were, they overlaid it. <clears throat> so we after taking lots of cores and uh, yeah we can use that as a base course. So instead of removing, we kept it all there. That saved a lot of money <laughs> in itself right there. Just innovate you know that's that's not really not innovation that's just standard pavement design. So look and how do you how do you make use of every pound of material in, 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 an, in an existing pavement so you can recycle and you know, that's a big deal too. Anyway, the point of the mountain was another similar project. One of the, the biggest projects that I feel the happiest about was this one. In the mid 90s, Ashto said we need a better procedure. Our design procedures are not very effective. So they came up with a lot of money. It was uh, over seven million dollars for about uh, seven years of work. We put together a big team of people who really understood all the materials aspect, the physical, the hydraulic, the thermal properties, traffic, loadings, uh, pavement, and all kinds of, for asphalt and concrete, not just a slab, not just concrete, but, but asphalt as well. And then you put that into a structural analysis with finite element. That's an area that I liked and loved a lot. And accumulate damage, calculate reliability, or set the reliability, and you turn back, go back through it. You know, how thick do you need to have it? What's the joint spacing? What's the dowel size? How much steel for continuously reinforced pavements? And so on and so on. And the same on the asphalt side. Same level of very great detail. Well, it was accepted, and, uh, has, and, and ARA had a big, uh, you know, software group that, that developed the software for it. I helped implement it in all these states. That was really a wonderful experience to do that, and to uh, people really caught on, and it was like pavement 101 for a lot of folks. So. Um, it's still going on today. The software upgrades go on every day. And the one thing that came out of something like this and others is that you do a good job, it is infinitely easier to get financing for the next phase of the work. And there's always things that need to be done. And consulting firms love that. Universities love that. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and then so you can keep keep going on things and really do things. One other thing, just very quickly, uh, all the way through from the, the 70s uh, through next year, <laughs> um, is international work. I really found this to be fascinating. Groups of people in all these countries who have similar backgrounds to me and I could interact with them, even in China. And I'll show you a project there. Um, and this is another, this is a big, for concrete payments. I don't know if you plan on going to that, <laughs> if Krakow is there <laughs> next June. Um, if Russia doesn't invade them, but anyway. So it, it, it's been a wonderful experience. I got to travel with 22 high-level engineers and contractors uh, all over Europe and interview people and then I had I, the only way I got on here was volunteering to do everything the right to report interview help document everything I, I just thought this is such a great opportunity to make myself known yeah I have to work hard but I'll do it and I did it so the report came out lots of new ideas and they're you know from Europe uh, Israel we were involved in the first concrete highway and the Cross Israel, which was asphalt as well. This is in Chile. I've been there maybe 30, 40 times. Wonderful country. Very much like California. They, in fact, Chile adopted about all the California specifications and design procedures. So they made the mistake, same mistakes that California made in many ways. And they had a lot of cracks on their concrete. So we tried to solve that over many years. And uh, they, they also came up with shorts the short slabs, that's their standard now. It's, uh, and it seems to be working. My utter amazement. Got to travel the whole Pan-American Highway, about 2,000 miles, and 
give presentation, take guys out. And, uh, what do you think? What would you do here? They wanted to upgrade it to a major interstate highway, the, all the way from, from Peru down to uh, Argentina, the very tip of the, of the country. Uh, so, but let me just tell you one more thing uh, here. If you ever get involved, somebody wants you to design a, a one-year extension or a, a exit or something, or a one month or one week, be very careful. Because the contractor will always want you to thin it up, save him money. And this project was in Toronto, big freeway, the QEW, going in and out of Toronto, and between there and New York. Yes, they wanted a one-year reconstruction uh, so they could, you know, uh, 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 and so they would just last one year, and then they could come back and reconstruct in full for a 40-year design and so on. Well, okay, a consultant from Canada did it, and it turned out to be too thin because people put pressure on that engineer to build it thinner because that was, they, they could make more money. They had fatigue cracking in all the wheel path. This is asphalt, wheel path here, here, and you can see they're overlaying that lane, uh, making it stronger. And, and so night after night, you had traffic like this. It was stopped. Um, and that created, you can even imagine the political backlash from that. How stupid is the, is the Ontario Ministry of Transportation to build something that's going to last one month and then fail. <laughs> I was in a room where there were 25, uh, mostly engineers, but some the senior administrators. And boy, it was a heated thing. Who's responsible for it? And who's going to, you know, lose their companies over? So you can get in trouble. And the same thing holds for any structure. You know, any structure. It's just, you got to be really careful and make sure you got reliability in there that you're willing to take that risk. Here's China. China, uh, you know, is it a building spree? Has been. This is about uh, 20 years ago when we, you know we were we were pretty good friends with China and they invited us over to give a seminar. And did they said we need your help? Come on out. They showed me this project and it was all failed. I said what? What happened? What happened? How long do your pavements last year? I asked them. They said, asphalt lasts eight years, concrete lasts, no, asphalt lasts five, concrete lasts eight. Eight years? <laughs> what? Uh, how can that be? Uh, so they said, we will pay you to evaluate this, and, and, and so we'll provide all the staff, and I, I have to bring several from our company over there. So we did a whole survey and we told them, go weigh 20 trucks, or no, 200 trucks, and measure every axle and tell me it's a single tandem or tritum. And what we discovered, that every of one of these, look, look at this thing. Every, every time you look down the roadway, you see a truck that's, there's one right, I think that's a truck. It, the axles are broken because they load the trucks up way more than the truck can handle. We, in the United States, we have weight limits, and we enforce them most of the time. In China, they have weight limits. They don't enforce them. In uh, many, many other countries, they don't enforce them. Because, you know, they need to move stuff, and, and, and that's more important than having payment failure. But if you, the, China copied all of our stuff uh, and built this pavement based on our design. But the, in reality, the loadings were many times higher than what we build, and so look at the disaster that happened. <laughs> look at that. So you learn so many things when you start dealing. Well, let me just skip over this. Uh, this is a really cool project. California came up with this idea. They wanted to design a hundred year. Let's see if you could do it. Well, we started out with a group of about four engineers talking, talking. The next week, there were six. The next week, 10. The next week, 20. And this idea became such a huge, interesting, challenging concept. It's a good thing to put on an exam, I think. <laughs> because you've got to do everything right if you want to do that. And if you do it, th I mean, this pavement's 70, 60, 70 years, both of these. This is San Bernardino up near uh, Sacramento. 
if you could do it, look at the advantages. And especially with regard to climate, all the reduction of pollutants and the recycling, the, all of that improves when you can design a longer life. And that's probably true for many structures, not just pavers. Certainly bridges. They're designed for 70. So what's 100? That's not that much true. OK, now let's, uh, let's finish this up. OK, just 10 quick things. Out of my career and life, uh, I really show gratitude and mutual and respect to your clients, your bosses, your co-workers. You will never regret it. You know, look plays a role, yeah. Good economy, no pandemic. <laughs> but hard work is the key. And I always believe what happens when preparation meets opportunity. And I say for my life, my career, yeah, I was, somebody could say, you're lucky, Mike, because you were right there at the right time. Yeah, well, but I was prepared. Sort of prepared. <laughs> you're never all fully prepared sort of prepared was enough to get me in the door and to do things that I, I, I enjoy. Well, but you still have to take risks, don't But you should then get lots of opinions. If you're asked to do something you don't, you're very unsure about, get a lot of opinions on it, do calculations. Travel, I think, is really a beautiful thing. You can travel and see the world and, and learn a lot and, and meet some great people. And finding a career you really enjoy is, is indeed tough and challenging, but not impossible. If I can do it, you can do it. I can tell you that. <laughs> because I didn't have that good of grades. I didn't have that much motivation, and, you know, until I had to clean chicken coops day after day after day and barnyards. A good, you know, some knowledge of statistics, probability, risk, reliability, variability. Everything is variable. Everything is uncertain to some degree in this world. No matter your bridges, buildings, traffic, and everything is that way. And you've got to understand that if you want to see how the world works. And then make advantage of that in your engineering. <coughs> And again, public speaking, I didn't tell you that UDOT, when I went to work with them uh, full time, required, basically required, told me to go attend a public speaking class, Toastmasters it was. And uh, that was worth everything. They really, you know, everybody critiqued everybody. You had to do speeches, you had to do jokes, you had to manage meetings, and boy, you learn <laughs> very fast. You've got three people criti critiquing you how well you're doing or how well you're not doing. It took a long time for me to overcome some of my weaknesses. Um, keep up to date. This has never been so true. Make sure you do, you, you document everything you do from now on and get, and, and who, who did you work for? And what did you do? And how long did you do that? Get a journal and write those things down. Because you, when you apply for your PE four or five years from now, you will need to, re, you'll need to know all that. And you'll have it. And you'll have a great resume. It's well documentation. If you need certifications or whatever. And number nine, uh, I, I know you guys are all young, healthy, but keeping physically strong health, health wise, mentally too through prevention. You know, in civil engineering you learn that everything you build has got to be maintained, right? Preventative maintenance. Rather than let the structure go to hell, to, you know, fail big, and then you've got to replace the whole thing. Well, you think of yourself, you're a, you're a machine <laughs> with our bodies. If you do preventative maintenance and you eat good food, you you know, exercise, you do things that way, you will never ever regret this. And there's only one more. Guess what that is? Anybody take it?